so good morning everyone we're still 20 minutes to go but i think i'll uh, maybe start by saying that greetings of the day everyone and i'm extremely proud to be hosting this panel particularly because we have uh, our South Asian uh, students from South Asian University from the Department of Relation, uh, International Relations who will be participating in this. Uh, we also welcome one a panelist from Triple One University and I'm so glad uh, that uh, you know his uh, title on the fifth debate in international relations so appropriately fits uh, in the theme of the panel today. So I am extremely pleased uh, and happy to be chairing this session on non-Western thought. Um, I am also particularly grateful to NICE uh, for having helped us host the session and be, being really open uh, to host this idea too, because I think it's very important to understand what does non-Western thought mean to a student of international relations. Um, and I would say that, you know, there are three broad themes that this question raises. Um, and given that there are two candidates who already stepped down, I thought that it would be nice for me to just have some opening remarks of, um, and utilizing the privilege of being uh, the chair. So I would say that the first, uh, 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 you know, point uh, uh, which um, gets raised here is primarily related to the decolonization of international relations, which uh, is needed, I think, because international relations has essentially been an Anglo-American centric discipline. And conceptually, I would say this has a larger ramification for concepts, for methods, for theories. We often use as students um, in IR to understand the fluidity of facts that inform international relations per se. Second, I would say that you know, this theme, this broader theme also has a direct bearing on strategic studies and foreign policy analysis as ways of thinking and logic of reasoning differs across geographical spaces. We have been sensitive. Uh, I think we have to be sensitive to uh, geography of thought. We have always been sensitive to geographical location, but I think geographies of thought uh, are also important, particularly in IR, where the presence of the foreign or say the alien other is often the starting point of one's analysis. So how does one communicate across cultures? Demands that an IR student is aware of the interaction between philosophy and strategy. And this is particularly important when we're talking about the Asian theater, because there are multiple civilizations here which need to be understood according to their own logic and thought. And then maybe we can have this conversation which we can truly call international. Thirdly, I would say that this broad theme also impacts how we interpret and mainstream sources and empirics stemming from non-Western intellectual traditions and histories of global South in particular. This not only raises, I would say, larger questions associated with the process of knowledge building, but also raises discourses around the relevance of area studies and international relations. You know, we've heard about the American way. We've heard about the ASEAN way. We've heard about the European way. But I think we are yet to think about the South Asian way. And that will only happen when we go beyond this very geostrategic construct that we call South Asia. So I would say that with these words, uh, let me welcome the panelists. Some of them, as you all know, have studied at the Department of International Relations, South Asian University, and are now doing research or teaching across South Asia and beyond. Particularly, um, I welcome uh, Chaminda um, uh, Padma Kumara, who is an assistant professor at the Colombo University, and Raj, who is right now uh, doing his PhD uh, from Australia. So I'm very proud to be hosting them in this panel. The others are doctoral students writing the dissertations, and I'm sure that in the next three, four years, they will be in fact developing some of these ideas and contributing to the process of knowledge production in international relations per se. So um, I would perhaps start uh, with a word of caution here. We have around, I would say, eight to 10 minutes being flexible with two minutes here because two candidates have dropped out. Um, but I think that um, if we you know, restrict to the 10 minutes window, which we have, we'll have some good time for discussion. And I think 
these sessions are all about conversations, conversations with each other. And I think uh, NICE is really doing a wonderful job in terms of connecting minds across spaces through this uh, virtual space. I also like to welcome our audience uh, for their interests and engagement. Um, so over to you, Dr. Padma Kumara. And um, Dr. Padma Kumara uh, will be speaking on a very interesting topic. He'll be speaking on the concept of mandala perspectives from Southeast Asia. Over to you, Dr. Padma Kumara. Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much, Madam. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank the chair and the organizers for organizing uh, this event and also uh, inviting for us to be panelists of this valuable conference. Today, I'm mainly uh, focusing on the how to broaden the existing theoretical horizon of international relations by giving agency to non-Western enterprises and the ideas that need more attention when IR is theorized. Now you can see the title of uh, my presentation. It is the concept of Mandela from perspectives of Southeast Asia. Basically, my major inquiry is how to make the discipline of international relations more international or more inclusive by acknowledging the non-Western ideas and experiences which are largely marginalized in the mainstreams of IR theories. According to some scholars, they have argued that IR theories are mostly based on Western ideas, methods, experiences, and practices, and they rarely recognize the need to broaden their analytical horizons. Another common argument shows that relations as a discipline is a Western dominated enterprise and IR scholarship has long focused on the importance of great power politics based on the Eurocentric Westphalian system in theorizing international relations. Now you can see how the existing IR theorization has been criticized. So as you see here, so IR theorization is mainly criticized for being not democratic and also some uh, scholars have criticized it not being global, international, not only that. So the major criticism towards the theories of international uh, relation is that they are Western oriented. And basically I want to uh, show that uh, the Another common criticism towards the theorization of international relations, that is to say that non-Western voices are not adequately heard in uh, theorization of international relations. And finally, you can see another criticism to say that less attention on promoting of non-Western ideas, experiences in IR theorization. In this context, let me briefly explain why this inquiry is undertaken, or the rationale for looking at the role of non-Western experiences in theorization of international relations. This can be explained with two major reasons. One is that the existing theorization of international relations has not paid attention to the non-Western experiences and ideas. And also the existing theories are more Western oriented due to lack of recognitions for non-Western experiences in theory production. Secondly, uh, I have identified that there is a need of exploring feasible alternatives coming from non-West to incorporate in theorization of international relations. So this is the motivation for undertaking this research. I basically want to simulate non-Western ideas, experiences in theorizing IR in order to make the discipline of international relations more international and more accommodative. As I told you, now the discipline of international relations is criticized not being able to acknowledge local agencies. And secondly, 
I want to highlight the significance of local agency in theorization of fire, how indigenous perspectives and how local histories can be a part of theorization of international relation. And thirdly, uh, I wish to explore ways of incorporating feasible alternatives from Mandela into our theory production through the concept of Mandela. Now, let me uh, share with you my key argument in this presentation. Based on these reasons, I argue that non-Western experiences that may include histories, cultures, norms, and worldviews assume great importance in theory building, and they can help IR to move beyond current Western centrism. Therefore, I particularly look at the concept of Mandela, the term used to explain the pattern interstate relations existed in pre-colonial Southeast Asia to argue that elements of non-Western experience and ideas are helpful in moving international relations from Western centrism. Now let me briefly define what is meant by concept of Mandela. As you see here, the concept of Mandela is a Sanskrit term, and it has both spiritual and political meanings. It refers to circle of kings expanding polities. So when you look at the pre-colonial Southeast Asia, we can understand how the concept of Mandela was defined as a pattern interstate relations. Mandela was the term denoted to explain system of interstate relations existing during pre-colonial Southeast Asia, and it advances the idea of unique political structures and can be attributed as a spatial model. When you look at Mandela, I argue that it is feasible alternative for non-Western IR theorization due to following research. So when you carefully examine the concept of Mandela, we can understand it as singular feature of pre-colonial Southeast Asian history due to its pattern structures. So when you see the diagram I showed you before, like the center periphery relationship. So the whole structure, political engagement was defined in terms of center periphery relationship. Within a Mandela, a statehood was not defined in territorial term. I think this is the most important point that I need to highlight. So when you look at existing Western theories, they're more into the idea of sovereignty. And also they are more into the idea of uh, territorial terms when they define the statehood so they mainly use territorial terms. But when you look at the concept of Mandela, it is very clear that it is solely defined aspect. So in the school terms, we can say that the Mandela can be considered as set of socially definable loyalties. I argue these socially definable loyalties or ideational aspects are having importance in understanding international relations. As local agency, I argue that the concept of Mandela can contribute to the theorization of international relation because it advances knowledge of regional pattern of statehood. It is not in conventional terms, so we can clearly see that the concept of Mandela can help us to move beyond the Western centric ideas because Mandela demonstrates just political cultural attributes that were existing in pre-colonial time. When you look at this analysis, you can clearly understand why I'm saying the concept of Mandela is important. So when we compare with the IR theories, so Mandela is different. So I'm saying that when we define the statehood in Western IR theories, they are mostly uh, focusing on the sovereignty territorial scale. But when we refer to the idea Mandela, 
So it is all about how we can understand the statehood from socially definable loyalties or from network of loyalties. I think this is the fundamental difference I want to highlight. So we can use this local knowledge as an alternative to support non-Western IR theorization. Let's look at how the borders are pursued by Western IR theories. So mainly uh, Western IR theorists look at borders as fixed and defined boundaries. But under Mandela system, we can advance new knowledge. We can show that their understanding about boundaries is different because under Mandela system, boundaries were defined as loosely uh, fixed boundaries. When it comes to the power structure, so generally what we see under Western IR theories so we understand our political systems, our structures uh, as hierarchical, but Mandela advances the power structure in different way. According to Mandela system, there was a center periphery relationship between rulers and the, those who were ruled by the center. When we consider the political system, under Western theorization, it is very clear that we can uh, know about diverse of political system that can be socialist or a democratic, but when it's come to the uh, concept of Mandela, it is all about how uh, a particular political system is patterned. Now, I would like to mainly focus on the contribution of concept of Mandela to IR theorization. As you see here, the concept of Mandela provide us region specific knowledge, particularly from Southeast Asia as a local agency. It helped us to make Southeast Asia as a local agency in theorizing international relations. So let me now uh, conclude uh, my presentation and I believe that due to lack of empathy and logical framework on non-Western ideas, experiences in IR scholarship, the existing theorization of IR has become more Western oriented. I'm not saying that non-Western ideas are not present in the existing theorization, but what we can see, the emphasis given to local elements, non-Western ideas, experiences are limited. So therefore, instead of mere incorporation, non-Western experiences, ideas should be systematically incorporated into IR theories through rigorous analytical framework in order to draw more attention. So I think that would be a good solution to highlight the importance, significance of non-Western ideas and experiences uh, when we theorize international relations. It is not about the absence of non-Western ideas, but rather to say that we need to have rigorous analysis and strong emphasis on the local elements and the historical perspectives. Finally, uh, I conclude that the concept of Mandela offers region specific and pattern understanding about the Southeast Asian history. Therefore, we can consider it as a viable non-Western alternative for theorizing international relations. Thank you very much. If you have any uh, questions, so I would like to answer when the question and answer session uh, start. Thank you very much, madam. And thank you very much, the audience.
Meda, uh, you are muted. Meda, ma'am, Dr. Meda. Yes, sorry, there's some problem with the internet. <laughs> but uh, let me invite uh, Raj Kathiawar. And uh, uh, Raj uh, is, uh, in fact, a uh, SEO alumna. He is also right now a doctoral student um, at the University of New South Wales. He will be speaking on a very interesting topic, anthropocentrism to post-humanism reflections on emerging water discourses from South Asia. I must also add here that Raj has had extensive experience in looking at uh, water diplomacy, the intersections between water diplomacy and water governance. So over to you, Raj, and I look forward to what you have to say. Your 10 minutes uh, start now. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Medha ma'am. Uh, and thank you, Nis, for giving me the opportunity today to speak on this said topic. Um, so I'm going to uh, basically address three questions or talk about three questions today and uh, address primarily the first two questions and leave the third one a bit open-ended because that's where I will intend to uh, begin my research and uh, delve into it in a much deeper manner. So, uh, the, and the first question is where my inquiry into this field began. And that is how do we look at water in international relations? And uh, whatever the literature that I've read through it, and there are two major uh, viewpoints within which we can you know, club uh, the discourses on water in IR. The first being that it is state-centric. Uh, and the second being that it is anthropocentric. I'll get into the details in a minute or so. The second question that I would, uh, I take it forward from the first one is that Anthropocentrism basically means that your whole mode of thinking is uh, such that you only provide uh, agency to the humans and not so much to the non-humans. So if that is the way you think, can we imagine uh, the idea of agency in a non-human manner? Uh, and that is where coming from philosophy, coming from political theory, thinkers uh, are of the view that we can think of non-human agency. And from there, the third question, which I go on to uh, probably think about, is that how can we then imagine a non-human understanding of water in international relations, and particularly if we look at from South Asia? So these are the three broad questions. Uh, I'll briefly touch uh, upon each of them in my presentation. Uh, so we we'll talk about the first one. Uh, how has been water looked at in IR and the discourse of it basically began in 1990s with the end of Cold War. Uh, Non-traditional security was being talked about a lot and water security in, this, in that broad ambit was being discussed. But when you talk about water security, what was it? Which actor was being secured in the kind of literature that was being produced? It was the state all throughout. Uh, and in this process, what was being the way the uh, it was being defined the discourse what we, was being defined is that state is what it can control which can tame which can determine how water resources uh, will be divided and distributed so conflicts or cooperation whenever uh, talks happen about that it was between conflict between the states or cooperation between the states uh, as in by uh, we reach in the first decade of 20th 21st century uh, the literature started expanding. We started talking about the critical literature came in, which sort of criticized the earlier form of writings on water. And they brought in political economy perspective, social construction perspective, human security perspective. And the, uh, the ambit uh, increased to not just the state, but also the human actors within the state, the citizens, so to say, the border, uh, land communities, et cetera, et cetera. But still the discourse largely remained anthropocentric in nature, which means that the way you think, the way the political processes are imagined, the way the society is imagined, is basically giving you the agency to the humans and thinking that all the other objects around it, including water, does not have any say in the way political processes get shaped. So this is how uh, the discourse has been largely uh, till now. And this is where the idea of post-humanism, which is emerging, which emerged outside of uh, international relations, and primarily it is being discussed in philosophy a lot uh, and humanities uh, a lot, but uh, and it's slowly coming to IR. 
comes into the picture. So what post-humanism essentially says and argues is that the non-human beings and actors uh, also have a role to play in the way our political processes are shaped and societies are formed. Uh, they co-constitute all the political processes and societies. Uh, this is the major basic argument of post-humanism. And taking it, uh, since there's a paucity of time, I will not tell in much into the detail of what post humanism is, but I will touch upon one uh, important scholar in the field of post humanism, which is uh, in the broader field of post humanism, is Bruno Latour and his idea of actor network theory. And the reason why I bring him in is because he very clearly and in a simple fashion defines uh, the idea of agency and how we can think beyond the way he currently think about agency. So for now, we think of actors or agency as some beings who can basically think, who can act and act with intentionality uh, in it. However, for Latour, these are not the criteria to define an actor. For Latour, basically an actant with what he calls as an actor, an actant. Actant is anything that modifies the state of affairs by making a difference. So there's no element of any intentionality or will involved, but the only factor that makes uh, that is important is the fact that there should be some modification in the state of where some changes in the way things are happening. And if that is if that's what exists, then whatever that being the thing is making the modification is considered an actor. Uh, and in this process, he qualifies it. He brings in a qualification by saying that we cannot look at these things in a causal manner, as in one actor doing something and then it leads to another kind of a result. He says that if we want to really think of non-human agency and actants, we have to move beyond this causal sort of way of understanding things because actants do not necessarily determine an action. They are not the only factor that determine an action, but what they do is they influence it in certain fashion. So they serve as a backdrop to both things. They serve as a backdrop which they might authorize, they might influence, they might block, they can forbid, and so on. So basically, there is a continuum which exists between one hand, a causally resulting in action, and then completely, on the other hand, nothingness. And in between is where the non-human actors come into the picture. So this is from Latour. There's one of the various philosophers who are writing on non post humanism and non-human beings. Uh, this idea of agency emerges. So this is one tradition. Uh, if you follow that, yeah, on the one hand, uh, till now, IR literature has not, uh, has been anthropocentric in nature, it has been state-centric in nature, but there is emerging literature which says that we can move beyond anthropocentrism, we can talk about non-human agency. And so that prompted me to then look at how can we uh, understand a non-human agency of water in international relations. That is the primary question which emerges. And it is being discussed in the field, if not in IR, but in broader social sciences. So there's an Australian a political theorist, uh, Asfrida uh, Nimanis, who has been talking about, uh, who has been writing about water as a non-human thing, influencing all our, uh, our, our society, our polity, et cetera, et cetera. And wherein she says, and it's a very interesting quote, so I'd want to quote over here as, as well. She says that water babbles in languages we do not fully comprehend. But instead of the violence of translation into concrete embankments, wherein we try to cage the water in embankments, we might do better just to learn to listen to water. And that's a very provocative and an interesting uh, statement uh, coming from her. And this is what is happening in fields uh, associated or in social science broadly, if not particularly in IR. Especially this is happening in the field of environmental history. There's also, of course, in natural history, uh, people have been working on how water influences a uh, political system, etc. Et if not directly, implicitly, these things have been there. Uh, in philosophy as well, uh, the kind of traditions that exist in India, uh, specifically say talking about monoism, talking about non-linearity, uh, they, they exist in India and this is what has been discussed now in the field of post humanism as well. Uh, so since there's uh, not a lot of time, I'll just pick up on one of the various strands uh, through which water is being imagined 
uh, in a post-human fashion. Uh, so there's a environment in, within the field of environmental history. There's a book by Sunil Amrit called Unruly Waters. Uh, when I read it, I was really influenced by it, and, and this is uh, this is what it is. And if you look at the title over here, I like can read it out. It says how mountain rivers and monsoons have shaped South Asia's history. So here, Sunil Amrit basically uh, prioritizes and brings forward. Uh, these non-human elements of monsoon or rivers basically determining and changing South Asia's or influencing South Asia's history. So looking at South Asia's history, not say with the perspective of the regimes which came in, Britishers, etc., etc., he brings out the history of South Asia from how the rivers went on to influence these uh, British regime, how when they went on to influence how India's engineers are going to shape uh, the modern India's history. Uh, and while he essentially talked about how engineers or freedom fighters and Britishers transformed Asia's waters, what he keeps on harping upon and highlights is the fact that changes in water ecology were then having an impact and were influencing South Asia's political regimes, they were influencing people's lives. To quote him over here, I like to say that he says that the history of water shows that nature has never truly been conquered. Water has served as a material constraint on every Promethean plan of growth and practice. And if one gets into the delves into the book, they'll, they'll talk about various droughts that happened and how they influenced people's lives and cultures and society and so on from right from early 19th century to the 20th century. And then if you bring these cues into international relations, there are various avenues which open up. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just wind up. I'll wind up with two very simple, uh, short examples. There's one on Susta River, uh, which is which, is, which waters India and Nepal. And the dispute on Susta River, which exists and which is still not got resolved, uh, emerged from the fact that Gandak River, which was considered a boundary between India and Nepal, changed its course. And that resulted in Susta changing from, uh, which was part of Nepal, then becoming a part of India. And now it is a disputed territory. There's another example, which is of New Moor Island, which emerged in 1970 uh, in uh, India, Bangladesh, borderland areas. And it uh, caused such an uproar that the two, the armies of the two countries uh, really went on to fire shots at each other in order to claim that island. And look at the, uh, the the dramatic occurrence of events that as they were negotiating who will hold the territory of Yumur Island, in 2010, because of rising sea level, the island again got submerged into water and is no more part of you know, the geography of the place. So these are, you know, these are like snippets here and there, but from there we can weave a story of uh, how non-human water is then going on to influence the politics, international politics in South Asia. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. And I think that was uh, really excellent. And I would say that Raj sort of raised fundamental questions. You know, the first was, how do you actually translate the non-human? And how do you also conceptualize the agency of the non-human? So translating the language of the non-human and conceptualizing the agency of the non-human. And while he took away, took off from science and technology studies, I think, uh, you know, when you look at the discipline of international relations, the ongoing discipline on relationality in international relations and how scholars in international relations are also primarily trying to look at some of these issues, it becomes very, very insightful. But I do also hope, Raj, that, uh, you know, you would, in fact, also get into perhaps uh, the South Asian intellectual traditions and see that how do they conceptualize the non-human, because the whole idea of non-dualism is very much embedded in the thinking of uh, the non-West. Uh, there in the West also, but it's not developed so much, but non-West particularly so. So on that note, I think uh, I will move on uh, to the next uh, uh, speaker. The next speaker, uh, we have, uh, in fact, two presentations here, and uh, both the presentations speak to a common theme. Both the presentations speak to the common theme of non-Western diplomatic practices lessons from Nepal. And the presenters here are Tikraj Koirala and Seema Shah.
Uh, let's see what they have to say, because I think they actually construct a very interesting argument, not only regarding non-Western sources of diplomatic practices, but also trying us, uh, you're telling us uh, to uh, really understand what role does textual analysis one and second, what role do games, uh, dances, et cetera, really have uh, for diplomatic practice? So um, on that note, uh, Tekraj, uh, over to you. And you have your five minutes starting from now uh, because there are two speakers. So maybe you can take five minutes and the uh, remaining five minutes then uh, can be taken up by Seema. Tekraj, over to you. Uh, am I audible, ma'am? Yes, you are. Uh, I would like to request Nimes for our point presentation presentation. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, at first, I would like to thank uh, NICE, especially Research Director Parmut sir, and uh, uh, my, also my sincere gratitude towards uh, moderator of these sessions, non-Western scholar on diplomacy and strategy, Dr. Medavist. And uh, today, um, uh, me and Sima Sa are going to present a paper on um, title Baksal and the Bepodes. Uh, I, I will cover the first part and she will cover the second part. Uh, uh, my inquiry start with an attempt to explore the sources, uh, which can be alternative uh, site to understand the strategic and diplomatic thought. As a student of diplomacy, I feel that there is overwhelming focus on treaties, agreement and interested interaction as a staple sources uh, to understand the diplomatic practices. Uh, in this uh, presentation, I argue that alternative sites such as Winky, uh, a Chinese board game, also called Go game, uh, and martial art, uh, chess, boxing, etc. can be employed to understand the techniques uh, and strategy for advancing the uh, insight on diplomatic practices. Uh, since my uh, since my presentation fall under the broad theme of the um, uh, broad theme of the um, non-Western uh, sources uh, of the diplomatic uh, and strategic thought, I will try to explore the some um, uh, strategic insight which stem from the Nepali board game Bakchal to explore and articulate the um, various strategic insight of Bakchal. Uh, I have uh, drawn the insight of, uh, from the literature of other strategic board games, such as Chinese, uh, Chinese Winky game and the chase. And because there seem the, some comparable rules and strategy between the Bakchal and uh, chase and go game, uh, I would like to um, show the slide uh, Three, please. Uh, the um, Baksal um, is a traditional um, uh, Nepali strategic games. Uh, uh, the Baksal is a Nepali word. Bag means tiger and Chal means movement, also called tiger's movement. This game is uh, between the four tigers uh, uh, and the 20 gods, which are asymmetric in power lessons. Uh, power lesson. Game is uh, played in the two phases. Uh, initially, the four tigers are in the position uh, in a four corner of the board as like uh, in a slide. Uh, uh, I would like to please uh, show the third slide, please. I think it's uh, uh, beyond the third slide. Before, uh, before this, yes, yes. Before this, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, placement of each got uh, is the focus of the first phase. Uh, placing got strategically uh, is uh, important as the tiger try to hunt the got in the entire game. Uh, in second phase, got can move to the in uh, to encircle the tigers. Uh, in this game, tiger have goal to eliminate the god by hunting them as a chess player. However, unlike the chess, the god of the goal of the god is to encircle the four tigers in the multiple engagement by making the continuous unified relational chain, and by preferring to employ the indirect strategy as a winky player do in their game. The god as a weaker power in this game use the indirect approaches and prioritize. Uh, uh, peripheral backend positions to form a strong continuous relational chain among themselves to encircle the mighty tigers in a proactive way. The larger idea is to trap the tigers, uh, thus uh, restricting the flexibility it has over the movement. As a result, tiger prefer to comfort the god in the direct way. Uh, and often uh, their strategies are reactive. Uh, and uh, uh, fourth slide, please. 
and thus uh, while there are some interesting parallel with other board games such as chess as a winky uh, 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 chess and winky and there are differences too with baksal for instance where chess and winky board game uh, spaces uh, uh, or positions are homogeneous in nature. You can uh, see in the slide first uh, chess and wing, and there, there is in the homogeneous uh, nature of the positions, and each and every position has a similar advantage. But um, in the Bakhsal board, positions are heterogeneous and hierarchical in nature, while there is no research uh, undertaken to explore the relevances uh, of the hierarchies of positions and impact they have uh, on the game. Uh, one can argue the position uh, and the location impact the result of the game. Position which uh, can give the leverages are thus uh, very much important for the both player in the entire game. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for instance, um, there are a few positions where a player uh, can get most leverages in the board. You can look in the slide, uh, the central positions and uh, this uh, and, and uh, the central positions adjacent immediate adjacent uh, diagonal are most leveraging positions uh, from where a player can uh, move uh, eight directions but not possible from the uh, all uh, other positions uh, this aspect is unique uh, in the backsal in comparison to the wingy and the chess games uh, from the above observations i would like to generalize the key strategy of the backsal player the player appropriate strategy uh, really depend on the two aspects. First, the relational combination and synergy uh, and power to act in the concrete between themselves, which give them collective agency, which is very important. And another, uh, there is also the need to think through the locations. Uh, positions uh, and locations uh, is a, in a strategic manner. The How the player locate themselves uh, become significant in the entire game to decide the victory. And I would like to conclude my uh, presentation uh, and, and by exploring the various strategies that God and Tigers have in the game, uh, it offers the insight on the various strategies on how the player communicate and encounter with, with each other in the entire game. Uh, with this, I would like to say that Baksal game as an indigenous traditional Nepali strategy game can offer the useful strategic insight uh, it can be considered as an alternative source of knowledge production in strategic studies. It can also offer some value to our understanding the relevances uh, uh, of non-Western sources in contemporary IR, uh, which is also our theme of the sessions. Thank you. Um, uh, if uh, there will be any questions, I will be uh, uh, very much happy with your questions. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Tekraj. I think that was wonderful. Over to you, Seema. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I would like to request Nis to put slides for my presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. I thank you. I would like to thank first of all Nice and the organizer team and my supervisor Medavis, Dr. Medavis, for giving me opportunity to present on today's topic. Since we have less time, so I'll directly jump into our topic of non-Western diplomatic practices. Lessons from Nepal. Um, when, when I was a master's student at the Department of International Relations five years ago, I had looked into textual analysis of Tibia place in relation to small state diplomatic practice. At that point of time, I had never thought that this particular thing could have some value in the discipline of international relation. As we can see that text has more of practical wisdom than the theoretical wisdom here. However, I decided to take up the challenge of extrapolating theoretical insights and thought of engaging with the larger concept of small state diplomacy. And in today's presentation, I'd like to reflect on some practical knowledge that DPO base holds for contemporary foreign policy of Nepal. In fact, uh, in fact, uh, I, fi uh, I find that the research work which I did five years back as a student is, is still relevant in guiding the diplomatic practices of small states in general and Nepal in particular. And the Bakchal game that Tekra just talked about can help us understand the teachings of Divya Upadesh. Next slide, please. Now I will highlight on uh, highlight the points that explains the text through the game. And there are four points and I'll be explaining that points. Next slide, please. 
the first point is like uh, uh, Bakchal is relevant in understanding small state diplomacy. When we look back to here, we will take insights from Nepal. So when we look back to early 18th century, Gorkha Kingdom was small in terms of power and resources. And it was a weaker kingdom compared to other neighboring kingdom. Still, Prithvinarayan Shah was able to conduct the successful unification campaign. This, so, this brings us to a historical puzzle, like how had Shah defeated the mighty power during his long time, uh, long unification project. And this, from this puzzle, it has provoked me to dig into his way of employing diplomatic and strategic processes and practices while undertaking the entire project. Now, if we look at the Bagchal game, which is a source of Nepali strategic thought, here goats, despite being symbolic of a weak power, can defeat the mighty tigers in the game. And how do they do that? They do that by using various suitable strategies. So, so this offers us insights to use goats strategies in Bagchal um, to explore Saha's way of strategic and diplomatic practices in the view of this. From this discussion, the research question that comes forward is that, how does the traditional Nepali Bakchal game help to explore the various strategic and diplomatic insights of Saha present in the view of this? And how do Saha's strategic and diplomatic processes resonate with both strategies uh, in the Bakchal game that was discussed earlier? So next slide, please. Okay, so now, Moving on to the second point, it talks about like how small states use indirect approaches in dealing with the mighty powers. If we look at uh, Saha's period, he used indirect approach in entire war to ensure his survival and he won over mighty powers uh, around him. So in the case of uh, attacking Kathmandu Valley, what he did was first he occupied the peripheral area of the valley, then he minimized Kathmandu Valley's possible leverage, then he came close to the valley, and then finally he captured it. It is same like what God does in the Bakchal game. So here, if we see Sahaj's strategies resembles with God's strategies in Bakchal, like God's block all peripheral potential options of tigers in early placement phase, and then they come closer by blocking opponent's tigers existing option. And then finally, they defeat the mighty tigers in the game. So how this indirect approach is used by small state, it is shown from, from text through the game. Now moving on to the third point. Next slide, please. Um, it talks about relational association that explains various aspects of life and society. This particular point covers, uh, provides holistic understanding on diplomacy and strategies. Uh, when we look at Saha, he faced various unsuccessful attempts during his journey, but he had a good leadership skill, which uh, and through that skill, he encouraged his soldiers. Uh, he, during that time, he emphasized on cultural, religious, familial, and social relation bonding to maintain unity among the soldiers. In addition, he also considered distance, timing, traditional, and religious aspects. For example, in case of Kathmandu Valley attack, he gave more leverage to implement his strategies effectively during the unification pro project. So this reflects like so broad views of Saha's on war. Like he looked at association of war with various aspects of society in relational manner. Like if we see in Bagchal, wars even being a weaker power, if they have perfect relational combination, they can encircle the mighty tigers. So here the relational association is soon seen from this point. Moving on to the fourth point. Next slide, please. Uh, there we can see the association with surrounding and how the position is relevant um, uh, while talking about text and through the game. Um, if we talk about Bakchal game, uh, this uh, this provides us that it is important to understand the position of players. It becomes significant because it determines the victory in the game. So if we examine Saha's mindset on various uh, strategies and diplomacy, we can see that he had good understanding on importance of ports, passes, citadel, and unique geographical location of hilly area to wage war successfully. So in Saha's approach on war, he was more pragmatic and synergizing his strategies with the environment. So his tactical way of dealing with his opponents was kind of showing perfect association with the surrounding. Uh, there he used the obstacles to his advantage and thus he made successful uh, despite uh, he was uh, inferior in power position. So these are the four points I discussed about. So in conclusion, if I have to say, then uh, this research explores various strategic and diplomatic practices uh, and processes which was used to win war by Prithvinarayan Sa during early Nepal, uh, during early modern Nepal. And this exploration of uh, strategic and diplomatic insights in the view of this 
which we can see through Bagsal, it offers unique insi uh, insights to us. And it, it, uh, it gives us basis to develop an argument that non-Western diplomatic sources can come from alternative sites and this would be explored by students of international relations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Seema. And I think uh, both Ekras and Seema, you did a wonderful job. Because whenever we try talking of diplomatic studies, you know, it's a highly, uh, it has a highly impoverished historiography, where we do learn about the experiences of great powers in Europe. And the sources, in fact, uh, as students of diplomacy, if I want to employ, it been largely restricted. Now, it's very interesting, because if you look at uh, some of these Asian sources, these Asian sources comes in the form of, say, texts, so Sun Tzu, uh, Patilya's Arthashastra, Divya Ubadesh become important, and I'm so glad that you actually brought in the vocabulary of Divya Ubadesh and Bakchal uh, to uh, this larger discussion on non-Western, which is highly centric on either Sun Tzu or Patilya. So I think, uh, uh, um, you know, I uh, really uh, uh, credit you on that. But also another aspect which came really out from this presentation is that there was too much of reliance on folk stories, uh, on uh, stories, on games to teach the princes. And this was practical knowledge. So I think rather than starting, say, with grand theories in IR and then approaching uh, some of these uh, sources, non-Western sources, it's very important to understand what is it that you know, they tell us. I think what Raj was really trying to tell us, what is the language that they speak in and how do we really translate it becomes the key challenge when we're talking about the non-Western. So um, I'm sure that they are questions, uh, but uh, thank you for um, sort of getting that debate uh, right on the spot. And I would like to invite my next speaker now, who is Sudesh Pokharel. Sudesh, in fact, is a doctoral student at the Department of International Relations. He is uh, working on uh, Bhutan and uh, international relations. Uh, so he has some distinct insights to offer when it really comes to uh, the understanding of Bhutan in international relations. But for the presentation, he will be speaking on uh, the larger theme of strategic culture. And um, uh, particularly, he'll be highlighting um, and conveying to us some insights from Bhutan. So uh, welcome, Sudesh, and over to you. You have 10 minutes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude to Dr. Miravich, Dr. Ramon Jaiswal, South Asian University and NIICE, including all the partner organizations for providing me with this highly intellectual opportunity. And looking into the prior presentation, I feel that we are definitely on way for a non-Western IR because I can see a lot on the platter, a lot of cuisine in the platter coming from different areas. And uh, what uh, Tickner and Blady talked about of being differently different is a sort of, sort of say, you know, coming through, I guess. So as a scholar from the so-called global south, which is also a non, I mean, Western uh, concept, you know, today I'll be shedding some light on important insights from the strategic culture of Bhutan. And I'm doing so with an ambition of releasing international relations from what William J. Long says, the dominant grip of Westphalian models and of self-interested states. So I do so by invoking, invoking the concept of Buddhist approaches towards international relations, which provide an alternative to the former. So the distinctive philosophic, uh, philosophical underpinnings of Buddhism not only uh, provides a basis of the contemporary world order, but also towards the most important aspect of everyday lives of the people, the political behavior, as well as the strategic culture of a certain state, in this case, the uh, strategic culture of Bhutan. So when you look at the study of uh, strategic culture uh, in South Asia, Dara Howlett says that strategic culture is already an understudied concept. And uh, in South Asia, it has its disadvantages, but I would argue that at, at the same time, it gives us the space to bring out the illustrations of an, of an alternative approach to balance the West. And uh, in the case of Bhutan, in that aspect lies two important questions as to what is the link between strategy and culture and uh, culture in Bhutan and how it has, in terms of culture, how it has shaped 
the security policies of Bhutan from a normative and ideational viewpoint. Uh, being a scholar myself, usually to answer such questions, uh, me and others working in the field of such culture, we persist to recognize the patterns of country policies which are reflective of the historical and national governance style. So does, you know, in this process, a holistic view is needed to capture the beliefs, the human purpose, and the meaning of life in relationship with the self and with the others. So in the case of witness such culture, what it has done is that it has pursued to reject a Western way of warfare, which emphasizes on victory through military force as the only means, so to say the, you know, uh, uh, clause with chain model. So you see that, you know, if you look into only uh, warfare as uh, the main domain of strategic culture, you see that warfare ruins the very nature of strategy and victory comes at the cost of strategic ruin. So although military power and resource mobilization is still a focal part of strategic culture, given its limitation, Bhutan has reserved its interest by marrying the unique culture with security policy. So a very good example, uh, looking back, uh, back at history, would be um, the death of the founder of Bhutan, who was known as Habtung Naonangas. He guided the uh, political leadership of that time. During that time, during that time, the government comprised of a uh, political administrative leader as well as a religious leader established under a team known as the dual system of government. And the interesting thing was that his death was kept as a secret for 54 additional years, which was understood by the general public as a very silent religious uh, ritual. So, so you can see that in you know, strategic culture, how it interplays with religion and culture within this domain. So this was done in order to prevent the successional dispute to avoid war, uh, since the legitimacy of leadership was highly dep uh, dependent on reincarnation and the religious leaders play, played a very important role. So the dualistic nature of the government is also visible under the current system whereby the government has one political body and one apolitical body. So thus, if you look into the contemporary system, places and bits of dual system thus are still seen. The places of strategic culture of Bhutan then becomes, you know, visible as the executive, the legalistic, and the judicial branch makes the political body, and the Dasam Rensum, which is known as the Commission of Monastic Affairs, makes the political body, which is headed by the religious head. So the, in, in this division of work, the political body handles the administrative reforms of the country, and the political body deals with, the, with conducting the spiritual uh, realm of the country. So as a result, you can see that strategy not only originates from a realistic domain, but it also stems from a very spiritual paradigm. So for an example, Buddhist discourses have played a major role in the evolution of strategies which put uh, Bhutan in a very unique position. It does so by relating uh, politics with religious teaching, specifically to vocabulary of Sawasum. The Sahasum is known as the concept of service towards the king, the country, and the people, which stems from the triple gem, that is the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. It also talks about Madhamsi, the highest, highest commitment, and Le Jutre, the Karmic Revolution, and finally Driglam Namja. There are other indicators as well, but due to time constraint, I won't be able to uh, complete it. So what Driglam Namja means is that it is appropriate code of conduct. So these unique vocabularies have molded uh, policies of Bhutan over time and this has translated into the backbone of strategic culture in Bhutan. So we, we can call them as the backbone because these discourses have been persistent over time and have tended to outlast the previous era of its original conception. So on numerous occasions of the National Assembly debate uh, relating to both uh, internal and external issue and uh, a brief internal issue I'll be talking about later. 
uh, the uh, both internal and external issues these conceptions have been invoked time and again so contemporarily we can now see that these discourses which have been culminated from buddhist ontology and epistemology have transgressed into the socio political context of present day bhutan so if we look into now if we look into some of the vocabularies that have informed the socio political and strategic dimension of bhutan we must start by looking into taoism so when you look into taoism taoism is something that has uh, flourished from the cultural conversations of the 1950s which uh, refers refers to the three jewels of buddhism which i had already explained earlier so the socio cultural translation of taoism contemporarily serves as a duty towards the king the country and the people taoism is a very vital discourse towards strategic formulation of policies in bhutan so much so that um, an early report on the state of taoism is being delivered by the prime minister of bhutan which addresses the country's security status it addresses the foreign policy happiness index health and it also reviews education economic status and employment status the second uh, vocabulary so to say that informs the strategic culture of bhutan is thadamsi thadamsi traditionally uh, refers to one's highest promise uh, or commitment or duty towards society and family it is frequently used terminology in bhutan if you go uh, into the society in bhutan it is something that is used day to day in and out so in the socio political context uh, a person with disloyalty to someone who has committed any form of misconduct against the government is conduct con- uh, is convicted to have no thadamsi that means he has no commitment he is no he has no good commitment to the state so hence in this context the person lacks a sense of responsibility towards the society and the state and on a broader perspective it is the profound relationship between the people and the state so thirdly when we look into vigram namja vigram namja which stands which uh, the literal meaning of vigram namja is for the conduct so however vigram namja is not totally uh, interpreted in religious terms rather it refers to the code of conduct that one should exercise being a citizen of bhutan so it is seen as the way of conscious order and the way of conscious harmony which uh, uh, richard white white cross has explained in detail in one of his studies yes ma'am try to wind the argument up sudesh yeah so uh, uh since the 1950s bhutan has passed through three essential phases uh, the security phase the cultural phase and the economic phase which uh, 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 professor meda has delivered in one of one of her writing and these discourses uh, became particularly relevant to this to the cultural phase where cultural discourses were used as a means of defining the identity of being a bhutani and the national assembly debate became more relevant in the context of taoism thadamsi lay judre etc one particular uh, case study uh, can be the 1997 uh, issue of bhutan with the ulfa the united uh, liberation front of assam and ndft uh, the national democratic front of uh, bodoland so internally the issue started running hot within the national assembly debate of bhutan but several talks with peaceful means uh fail to make them leave so since the very fundamental principle of bhutan was a great faith in terms of uh, respecting and protecting the dignity of taoism uh, bhutan was forced to engage in a combat, uh, combat so this demonstrates the aim of bhutan government to destroy uh, i mean all forces that work work against the uh, political culture of taoism so so in a broad uh, conclusion which this discussion arises at goes beyond the realistic understanding of international relations and it focuses on the distinct uh, national styles which are particularly non western in nature which countries uh, develop over a period of time so non western strategic culture therefore is uh, an analytical entry point to understand uh, various uh, country policies in south asia thank you
Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Sudesh. Uh, I think there's some uh, sort of problem, I think, in uh, the voice, uh, but I, we, we did get the broad, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, insights uh, that we're really trying to uh, convey uh, to us. And one of the broad insights which really comes up from the session uh, is that indigenous vocabularies are very important to understand because these indigenous vocabulary, uh, vocabularies have a distinct characteristic which can help us to understand, say, uh, a specific foreign policy uh, or a strategic choice uh, which a specific country uh, makes. And I think um, given that Bhutan is a really a less studied country, it's very rich in terms of its unique cultural heritage. But I think how Bhutan has also used some of these indigenous vocabularies like, say, Sawa Sum or uh, Ladamchik or Le Judre, uh, which Sudesh was talking about, become extremely important, again, for a student of international relations to really locate the voice of uh, the non-Western. And um, on that note, uh, let me move on to the next presentation now. The next presentation is by Mujib Khan. Mujib is again a doctoral student at the Department of International Relations at the South Asian University. And Mujib will be speaking, I think, on a very important topic that concerns all of us today as being citizens um, and inhabiting this place called South Asia. He will be speaking on uh, violence and ontology in Islam. So Mujib, over to you. You have say 10 to 11 minutes. Mujib, yes, great. Thank you very much. So, uh, so my topic is violence and ontology on Islam. And I want to clarify at the beginning, I'm not using this jargon of ontology to to create ambiguities. What I'm trying to do with ontology is to simply point out that I'm inquiring into a political ontology, ontology as a political phenomena. That is the state in which you understand a unit or an agent, for example, as a state and an ontological unit, which characteristics we understand it using political characteristics rather than any philosophical depth into what being a Muslim is. What I am trying to do here is to understand how the process of violence influences the ontology of political subject in Islam. So I'm pitching this specific presentation at the intersection of the debate in uh, non-Western thought currently, which is, uh, which is the debate where, uh, where the problem of authenticity and the question of negotiating difference in non-Western thought has come up. As you have seen that the project which Acharya and uh, Guzan started has come under increasing pressure, starting from their original non-Western theory project and now to their global international relations project. The critique given by Giorgio Shani, Rosa Vasiliaki and others has been that it is insufficiently political, that it, is, that is, it isn't representing the difference and the core of a non-Western, say a, a particular non-Western thought. Say for example, it isn't properly representing a Hindu or a Sikh or an Muslim point of view or a Muslim way of being in the international. Th that has been a major critique. And understand this, the political which they speak about, the, uh, the political which Giorgio Shani and Vasiliaki talk about, is the political understood here in the Schmittian sense, as is used by Carl Schmitt. Political here denotes the possibility of existential violence, which gives uh, the, which provides you <coughs> the uh, ability to realize yourself in international spatially. Political here is connected to both a spatial form of realizing yourself as well as the possibility of existential violence. Violence can, in this particular thought process, can organize itself into any number of or in any particular element in a particular thought. But for us, we have to understand what we are dealing with in international relations. The speciality which is embedded in international relations is the statehood, nation state. And the violence that uh, the IR legitimates or the violence in which it was founded and uh, which it legitimated was interstate violence. Any violence which is below this level or above this level, below this level as in non-state or transnational armed groupings or over the state as in supranational organizations such as empires, they are illegitimate forms of warfare in this. How does this uh, relate to Islam? So first of all, in Islam, the primary ontological unit is not the state. The primary difference between political theory in Western and Islamic thought is the good of 
the polish and good of the community, the ummah. Western thought primarily de deals with the good of the city state and indirectly with the good of its inhabitants, which can be classified into a number of uh, different hierarchical moods, for example, citizens, refugees, slaves, women, and etc. in its original uh, form. But in Islam, the dividing line between community and non-community would be faith, that is faith in one God. And that obligates them to follow a particular set of rules and a particular way of being in a community, which is, uh, which is not exactly divorce, but it is not uh, overridden by cultural or ethnic consideration. It is rather driven by faith-based considerations, faith in one God and which, which obligates Muslims to follow a particular law, which is the Sharia law. Now, how do we find the origins of violence in Islam? How do we understand the relationship between violence in Islam and the international? So first of all, we have to go to the beginning, very beginning, which ha we, we have to go to the beginning wherein, where, when Islam first appeared in Mecca, it was circumscribed heavily. It did not first come out as a violent religion or promoting violence, it simply came out as a preacher religion. In Mecca, they, they faced heavy resistance. So when the migration from Mecca to Medina took place, the first course of business became ending the political primacy of the other. Within Quran, you find three different types of verses. One verse tells you to have dialogue with the non-Muslim. Second type of verses tells you to end their political primacy by engaging in combat, what you call jihad. And the third type of verses prevents forcible uh, forcible religious conversion. Now this creates a massive confusion. You're telling people to enter into dialogue and then you're telling them to fight and then you're telling them not to forcibly convert. What, however, this is a very coherent way to go about it. What the initial experience of Muslims was that they were not allowed to preach the religion freely. So what they figured out is if we end political primacy of other, relig other religions, without forcing them to accept Islam. We can preach freely in those societies. So unlike uh, the later Protestant imperial ventures, Islam did not forcibly convert or try to change the cultural or ethnic make of the, of the communities it came over. And it uh, in different parts of the world, Islam interacted accordingly in different ways to these subject populations or in many times, like in South Asia with the Rajputs and the Mughal Confederacy, it was in partnership. And free, free preaching has been the core of processing central uh, processing violence in the international. However, there are other themes in this. And this is, uh, and I want to speak specifically on how it relates to the nation state system. In Westphalian systems, you have a different mode of being in the state. You have the primary mode of being in the state is by way of citizenship. You don't have the same mode of being in a community. You don't have ethnic considerations in Islam in, in terms of being to a community and having obligations or rights or responsibilities towards and from a community. But this creates heavy uh, problems uh, with a nation state system. Nation states want, a nation state system would want to concentrate authority in its own hands and it would want obligation to be directed towards itself. When in Islam we look, the sovereignty clearly resides where the God resides and which is in its law. So whenever we find the demographic tensions which arise irrespective of ethnicities and other considerations, we see that these particular modes of authority are in intersection and they create antagonisms. So we, so we, we technically find that this particular mode of being, nation state system, enters into a very violent entanglement with Islamic way of being. And now, the, this primary register of free preaching and freedom of religion, which was there uh, in the minds of first Muslims, the, this projects of, this produces this secondary form of verses, which I talk about, engaging in combat. This produces this type of feeling and rememorialization of these events and these thematic battles, which have taken place in Islam over the years. So for example, the Mongol invasions or the first battles of Islam. Uh, such as Badr and Uhud. So what it does is it, it regenerates those memories and it produces and projects a political ontology to the other. For example, very specifically to the Christians and Jews that you have to contest their political primacy in order to freely preach your religion 
and to freely be in your religion. So when we see in modern form, modern context and contemporary context, we see that when religion and secularism come into context, it's only where free free preaching of Islam comes into context, such as in France uh, or maybe sometimes in different West European states, we find that the violent impulse awakens and those verses which allow you to part, engage in combat, they come into play. And this is how violence pro is processed in Islam. And it's, this is how it endows itself and the other in, in, in this way of thinking with a particular political ontology. Thank you very much. Jeep for again uh, raising, I think, some fundamental questions when we are actually dealing with this very important ontological question of what we study, you know, the study of being. And I think there is where uh, you got in some um, excellent suggestions um, and your critique of it was also primarily directed towards the imperialism of categories uh, that uh, is quite prevalent, I would say, in the discipline of international relations. And I think, again, you know, as students of IR, which is primarily about cross-cultural communication, it becomes very important that students here interact and understand the intersections that stand between strategy and philosophy, which is very important, uh, particularly uh, in uh, the current times when uh, there are waves of majoritarianism and nationalism, uh, which uh, are overwhelmingly, I would say, influencing uh, the discourses of our times. Um, I'm sure that, uh, you know, there would be questions. And uh, I would, in fact, uh, uh, request all of you to please type your questions on the chat box so that we can have a good discussion. There's some excellent ideas which have come forth, but I think one needs to uh, really have that, uh, uh, you know, meeting of minds, uh, conversations across minds, uh, because I think this is really, truly a South Asian panel. Uh, we have uh, uh, a panelist from Bhutan, from Sri Lanka, from Nepal, um, and I'm sure there are some uh, audiences, uh, you know, from Bangladesh and other countries too. Uh, so on that note, uh, let me invite the last speaker now. The last speaker is Rajiv Kumar, and he again is going to talk about a very important intervention which has been made in the discipline of international relations. Um, his presentation is on the fifth debate of IR. And I think I'm very happy, in fact, when I looked and I read the title of your presentation, because uh, in terms of talking about the non-Western, it's important that we do not just end up at the theoretical level, but we engage with some of these fundamental issues at the meta-theoretical level, uh, at uh, the level on which the theories of international relations are primarily based on. So over to you, Rajiv, and you have, say, 10 to 12 minutes, and I think we have some substantive amount for discussion after that. Rajiv, over to you. Thank you. Namaste, everyone from Kathmandu, Nepal. Uh, I express my thanks to all of you. And Rajiv, we cannot hear you. Can you, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, voice is not at all audible. We've had problems with the uh, uh, with this before, but then at least part of it uh, was at least audible. You can just can come you, next. Can you hear me? It's it's very can soft. You me? Can you hear me? Can you put the mic maybe perhaps near you? Yeah, I'll put my so, mic. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, it's 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 uh, very soft, you know. It's it's. Can you hear me? Uh, Mr. Rajiv, sir, uh, we hear you, but your voice is too soft. So, I recommend you to unplug your earphone and proceed with the uh, uh, your presentation, sir. I think uh, the technical issue will be fixed if you do that, sir. I have completed my PowerPoint slides to. Yeah, yes, sir. We have on your slide, but your voice is too low to hear for all of our participants, sir. I have submitted my paper as well as my slides also. So, if voice problem, then you may not be hearing clearly. Hello. 
Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Still, your voice is uh, not coming to a level where every participant should be able to listen to you clearly, sir. Okay. So, did, did you unplug your earphone, sir? Yeah, yeah. I unplugged it. Uh, can you please uh, uh, turn off your video and uh, make sure that you are in close proximity with your microphone, sir? Uh, so that uh, it would be easier for uh, us to listen to you clearly. Yes, sir. Make sure you can put near your, uh, like, um, be near to the uh, audio receiving device, sir, microphone. Yeah. Hello? Hello? Uh, yes, sir. You are audible, but uh, the voice is too low to hear, sir. Uh, I'll be speaking. Uh... So I begin with uh, my paper. I thank uh, NICE and the International Studies Committee. Uh, I'm very proud to present my paper on peace to debate in international relations to or an enduring grand day. And the subtitle title is Hypothesis or Synthesis in the Emerging Peace Paradigm Today. You know, as an international relations student, I've been taught about uh, debate in the paradigm debate. There are four debates in uh, international relations theory. Two debates are on ism, ism like liberalism, realism, Marxism, international political economy. And uh, later variants of this, this is the neoliberalism, neorealism, neo-Marxism, and radical international political economy. And there were other two debates on methodological, epistemological, and ontological domain of international relations history. And in these uh, two debates, uh, the earlier debate in 1960s, I believe, uh, were on behavioralism versus post behavioralism. And in uh, 1980s and 1990s, there were two debates on positivism versus post positivism. And I believe that uh, after the end of the Cold War in 1990, the rise of the non waste is beginning to change what we experience and perceive uh, the world, perceive our world today. And I think our signpost of this debate has been emerging. And there are a couple of articles I referred for this fifth debate. And this debate is uh, not uh, uh, about fully. But I believe that uh, the earlier presentations have given some kind of ignition to push forward uh, this debate into uh, new brainstorming. And uh, the, the hypothesis and synthesis, I believe that uh, the Eastern, the non-Western, and the post-Western discourses are some kind of hypothesis that the fifth debate will be commenced soon. And uh, the, you know, as we, the discipline has been uh, American centric and European centric. Now, the opening of the world and globalization, as well as localization trends, the debate uh, is getting more enriched with the discourses from the non West. There are debates also from the global north and the global south. But both, uh, overlapping the West and the East, or the non-West or the post-West. And all these debates have these uh, own underpinnings on human nature, global state of nature, and global social contract theory, I believe. And uh, all are guided by the Enlightenment tradition. The Western discourses were also governed by the Enlightenment tradition since the uh, 17th century. And uh, I have a, I differ from the Enlightenment purely Western, or purely Eastern. I believe uh, enlightenment is uh, universal, and there are universal aspirations, and uh, there are local knowledges, knowledge systems, and that, in fact, uh, enriches uh, policy ecosystem uh, of uh, different uh, geographical uh, areas, uh, political territory, and even the politics. So politics has been becoming more uh, without frontiers. There are uh, issues and interests, both uh, global and national. 
and there are complexes, both national, local, and global complexes, some kind of security complex or impurity complexes. And you know, IR is uh, since time you know uh, to IR uh, international relations as a field of uh, engagement, dealing, civil as a new aim in its uh, rising and uh, in uh, international and domestic affairs issues are overlapping there are policy uniformity as well as policy paradoxes and policy redox also due to these uh, localization uh, advance so i think the debate is uh, the fifth debate maybe the final uh, or maybe the end of the paradigm debate actually so even uh, this, this, this is questionable and um, it's very curious to learn how the trends uh, move in uh, theoretical areas. Uh, I think the theory also is derived from practice and theory also guides practice. So I find it very interesting and challenging uh, the fifth to debate. And I believe the rise of the non-waste will contribute more vigorously and uh, productively to maintain an uh, equitable world order, uh, justice, liberty, and in pursuit of truth. So our local learning, knowledge, and wisdom will challenge the Euro-American societies of IR, the asymmetric of knowledge domain also, even the moral politics and real politics divide. So in the knowledge, methodological, epistemological, and ontological features of IR will be more uh, inclined towards the non-way. And there may be more methodological uniqueness also. Uh, uh, we will be getting more intellectual exercises in the coming years. So I believe that the fifth debate is very interesting, very challenging, and empowering also to the non -world. And I benefited from all your presenters as I created as well. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak on this uh, occasion. And I hope we will further uh, improve uh, and develop uh, the non Western perspective. Thank you. Thank you. I literally have to stick my ear next to <laughs> the, uh, the, the mic, you know, to just uh, uh, listen to what you have to say. And uh, I think, you know, there are quite some interesting points which come in there. And how do we, or where do we really locate some of these discussions or these ideas that we've been really talking about? And um, I think the last presenter, you know, uh, Rajiv, uh, he, uh, in fact, raised fundamental questions. And apart from that, I would say that it's also very important to really look at, uh, you know, how does... Uh, IR or international relations as a discipline really treat the question of science. Um, and I think uh, right now, if uh, you look at uh, the state of the art literature uh, in the field, um, you know, uh, there are multiple debates which are really coming up in terms of, uh, 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 you know, how, uh, uh, you know, how uh, I would say, uh, you know, philosophy of science in particular has progressed over a period of time. And, um, uh, in fact, when you really try to make sense of these multiple cosmovisions, which in fact gave um, uh, you know rise to ways of uh, knowing and understanding the world, you see the non-Western thought there equally trying to make a contribution. But I think that kind of an engagement, you know, has to be done in conversation with some of these debates uh, on science and international relations, um, on the role of dualism and non-dualism in theorizing phenomena. And I think, uh, uh, and, and there is where, you know, when you uh, look at Bruno Latour's uh, sort of analysis uh, uh, or, uh, you know, scholars from science and technology studies really trying to make sense of how do you understand agent structure? How do you understand change itself? You know, some of these debates are very much in here in international relations being talked and debated by the scholars as such. I think the real challenge for us is to not really start at the level of theory and say that, well, there is a difference between the West and the non-West. We're not essentially talking about binaries here. There has been a cross-pollination of ideas and, you know, scholars like Amitabh Acharya or Ada Bozeman, you know, have written extensively on the subject 
where they really talk about the localization and the internalization of these ideas, uh, you know, in different geocultural spaces. So I think, uh, you know, when we are actually talking about especially the fifth debate, as you put it, Rajiv, you know, how do we actually treat science in the discipline of international relations? I think that really becomes a key question. And what is really being said, you know, by the scholars right now, who are in fact writing and thinking about these subjects in the discipline itself, I think becomes one of the major entry points uh, for us to engage with these issues. Uh, we have around, I would say, 30 uh, minutes, uh, which is a good time uh, to have a discussion. Um, do we have any questions? So I see one question. Um, I know uh, there are some, uh, um, the, you know, the, the, there are some um, interventions here which say that we cannot hear a thing. I mean, I mean, so therefore, you know, I literally had to stick myself, you know, to what the speaker was really trying to say in the last presentation, but then really trying to then extrapolate, you know, how does it really relate to uh, some of this fundamental question that he was or the larger theme that he was really trying uh, to address. Um, but um, I'm sure that, you know, in case you have any questions on uh, the great debates in international relations, it itself, you know, has been very contested. You can please write your questions on the message box. Uh, the speaker can respond, uh, um, you know, in the chat uh, uh, window itself uh, in case he's, uh, are not un he's not audible. But let me just, uh, in fact, uh, go to uh, Tekraj and Seema here. And I see the first question in front of me. And the question says, uh, Seema and Tekraj, what wisdom can Bakchal offer to Nepali political leaders and government in these contemporary times? I think very important, very important because we are in this process of democratization. Uh, there is this tension between the center and uh, the uh, provinces, uh, you know, the center and the states. And I think this is not just unique to uh, South Asia. But uh, yes, what do you have to say about uh, 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 about uh, uh, you know insights or uh, some of uh, the developments in Nepal at this point of time, and how does uh, Bakchal uh, sort of respond to it? What are the strategic insights or the political insights which you get from this game? Yes, over to you, take Raj and Sima. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I would like to respond uh, these questions. Uh, uh, if we look the Nepali contemporary challenge, which is also associated with Nepali leaders, uh, which is a foreign policy a dilemma or foreign policy problem, uh, which how to um, balance or manage the India, China, and US uh, uh, in the regional, uh, uh, like uh, growing in, in background of the growing regional uh, uh, rivalry between China and India uh, and China and US also. So um, in that regard, like uh, in between the China and India, Nepal as a, uh, which is a very small power. And um, I think uh, the got strategy which used in the Bakchal can be more appropriate for the contemporary Nepal, which is, uh, uh, I would like to say, like uh, in the Bakchal, got as a weaker power. It always prepared the indirect strategy and emphasize on the relational aspect and association with all the available resources in holistic manner to strengthen the uh, collective agency of gods. That is uh, like here, I think uh, Nepali, Nepal as a weaker power uh, in between the uh, other great power, uh, we should prioritize, like uh, if we look the Nepali, all the uh, uh, history, geography, and the, uh, all other things, uh, political, um, politics, ideology, all the things, uh, I, I think uh, I can uh, see, observe the, some great limitations. Uh, which we should uh, prefix uh, it early. Otherwise, um, at, uh, as in the back cell, uh, if a god uh, does not prefix uh, its uh, limitation or vulnerable point, uh, at that time, god, tiger can exploit this uh, uh, god's vulnerable point. So god in back cell always prefer the indirect strategy to at first mitigate the uh, its all vulnerable point. In same manner, Nepali leaders or Nepal should um, have prefixed uh, Nepali some uh, limitations, uh, which is like uh, economic dependency and consistent foreign policy um, priorities and political stability. Uh, so in the same manner, we should uh, prioritize on these things. Uh, then I think, um, uh, uh, we can um, easily or effectively balance them, ma'am. 
Yeah, adding to Tekra's point, like if we see the current situation of Nepal, uh, it's in the the democratic, uh, the democracy is in the transition phase, a very critical phase right now. At this point, uh, the role of leadership for the leaders also becomes very important. So in the Bakchal, and if we uh, look at Bakchal and the text together, we can see like during uh, Bak, uh, du in during Prithvi he played one of the great role as a good as a skillful leader to how to take forward the uh, the current the situation at that time so right at this moment also this is one of the thing like good leadership skill it is also very important if we see the contempt uh, the, the the situation now and that time the leadership skill becomes very important thank you I think, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, both of them really responded uh, very appropriately to this question. Uh, because when we look at some of the wisdom which is coming from these non-Western sources, the internal and the external essentially is intertwined. And I think to make a position outside or, you know, just focusing on uh, positions, positions, positionalities of actors without really looking at the meaning of comprehensive power or national power, I think which Tekraj was really trying to uh, communicate uh, through the use of uh, relationality and, you know, how relational power becomes one of the important assets uh, for the goods. I think uh, there is where uh, one needs to really look at that the domestic is equally important. How do you actually uh, try to, uh, 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 you know, get that collective agency from the domestic level becomes important. Um, in terms of uh, positioning, uh, say, when it comes to uh, foreign policy choices. Now, another question which I see, and this question is directed to Raj. Um, it says that a lot of colonial scholars derive the Indic traditions of animals and non-humans, speaking with humans in traditional stories as animated voices of the subaltern, putting their voices on the mouth of persons belonging to castes uh, oppressed uh, in the hierarchy. How does this influence the scholarship of providing water central agency in the narrative. So Raj, what do you have to say regarding this? This is by um, Devdan. Yeah, I'm just going to read it once again. Um, there are colonial scholars. Hmm. Uh, OK. Uh, I mean, I think I'll have to think through it a lot, but for now, what is coming immediately in my mind is uh, a book by Mukul Sharma called Cast in Nature. Um, and there, of course, you can't deny the complexities which come in from a particular region. Uh, so water and cast are like very intrinsically, uh, you know, intrinsically linked over here. So when you're talking about, say, prioritizing non-human water, and I am talking about say, international relations, that is in one way. But if you're looking at the society uh, in the broader picture, you have to critically look at whatever traditions have been existing uh, and how they have been, you know, oppressing, uh, have been oppressive or how the power relationship exists within that particular context. Uh, so if you're talking, say, some uh, deriding uh, way in which interpretations are made within the tradition, then they cannot be taken up uncritically in the present times if you are developing or you know creating new forms of knowledge. That is how uh, every you know knowledge tradition is picks up on whatever is happening around and then it takes it forward. So it's not about copy pasting from the past and then taking it forward uncritically. You have to engage with how things have been uh, interpreted in various. Uh, theoretical, philosophical, or disciplinary traditions, and then building up your arguments, taking all those things into account, you develop your understanding of, say, what are in other things. Yeah, that will be a short answer. Thank you, Raj, and thank you, Deep Tanu, for that question, because I think, uh, you know, it uh, essentially raises uh, quite a uh, uh, a thought-provoking sort of um, you know response to your mind, and there are I would say multiple ways of approaching it. But then, how water can essentially become a site of looking at uh, power hierarchies uh, or the intersection between knowledge and power, not only in the epistemological sense, in the sense of how you produce knowledge or what is produced, but also uh, in terms of the empirics of what you really see in the ground. 
And uh, water really gives you uh, that, I would say, lens to not really look, not only look at, say, one's uh, scales, uh, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, at uh, the interstate level, but at multiple scales. And uh, yes, I mean, you know, if one really takes water as the primary lens and tries to look at these power hierarchies, you know, different kinds of power hierarchies, there'll be different types of analysis and conclusions that you would come to. And that I think would be an interesting project on its own. Uh, any other questions which are there to other speakers too? Yes, we do have some time. Uh, I can ask one to Chaminda because. Um, yes, Chaminda. Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, Chaminda, you were talking about you know various classifications you made, statehood, uh, Western, and uh, how Mandela looks at it, and you talked about power, uh, wherein you talked about Mandela being about center and periphery, and uh, the the West, Western way of looking at power is hierarchical. Can you just probably? Uh, elaborate a bit on that and, and so that I can, uh, I can get a better sense. Raj, uh, thank you very much for your question. Raj, can you uh, kindly repeat the uh, latter part of the question, Raj, please? Basically, uh, uh, the concept of power and how were you, uh, uh, um, and what are your thoughts on it? Uh, based on Mandla and how the Westerns uh, look at it. Yeah, thank you, Raj. Uh, basically, when we look at the uh, model uh, of Mandala system, so when we uh, consider Mandala as a geopolitical model, Raj, what we can learn that it is uh, totally different from the way uh, that we define the statehood and the power in the contemporary world politics. So that is why I was thinking how this kind of historical model uh, can uh, be used in understanding contemporary uh, international relations. Per se, uh, when we uh, closely examine the power structures and the power relations uh, that were existing uh, under Mandela system, it is very clear that the power relationships were different. For example, center was represented by the ruler and the other layers were represented by the subordinates and how they were connected, how the center was connected with the periphery was really interesting because uh, they were connected through network of, network of loyalties. And also they had kind of relationship that uh, we cannot see in the contemporary international relations. So that is why I'm uh, saying that the idea of Mandela concept will help us to see uh, power relationships and also uh, the uh, statehood in different ways. Uh, but I'm not having absolute claims saying that uh, Mandela was having very uh, uh, fixed boundaries and we, we don't think that we can say that it was a very fixed uh, way of looking at uh, uh, statehood. But under Mandela system, at least we can see some pattern and consistent way of uh, uh, interstate relationship. So that is why Raj, I wanted to highlight the concept of Mandela as something new, which can help us to move away from the conventional thinking. Thank you, Chaminda. I think, uh, 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 you know, it, it raises fundamental questions to my mind. Again, you know, when you're really thinking about the international. Now, one of the wisdoms, I think, which comes in from the Mandala, which Chaminda did uh, as part of his, uh, you know, uh, doctoral uh, research program, he was really trying to look at, you know, these two concepts of Mandala and ASEAN and see you know, uh, whether the ASEAN way has something to do with that. And that was very interesting because one of the facts which really comes out and which in fact comes out from his response right now is that connections and relations became fundamentally very important. And when you are really looking at the ontology itself becomes connections and relations. You know, there is a relational ontology, how you define ontology or you, you know, something with Mujib was also sort of problematizing when he was uh, invoking the word ontology and, uh, uh, you know, this distinction between how 
different there are different ontologies uh, in the western uh, tradition and say in the islamic tradition it's it's sort of fascinating because you know when you actually make relational ontology the key entry point there is where the concepts which you are using for instance uh, uh, power in this case will have a very different interpretation altogether and i think that's very important particularly in today's world again because we are not just facing traditional threats we are facing non traditional threats too and these are wicked problems which are closely intertwined with each other so do we really need to have alternative lenses alternative ways of knowing and understanding the world is something where i guess you know your engagement with the non western intellectual traditions and thought can really help you in terms of taking this debate further so uh, thank you for that chaminda and uh, you know the body of literature around relational theory of world politics or on relational study of world politics or relational ontology you know which again has been you know it's being studied by scholars all over the world you know should the interest of uh, uh, should be of interest to you and see that how this case really adds on to the broader question of relational ontology so um, any more questions which are there for other speakers yes we have some more time i think we have a good 10 15 minutes with us or else then what i'm going to do is that i'm going to give the podium to each and every speaker probably to give the last word the, the take away you know from your presentation itself the fundamental take away and that would be really the really for the benefit of the audiences i uh, i know that you know you've had 10 to 11 minutes but rather than posing any specific question what is the basic take away you have to give us when we are really talking about non western and international relations it could be a critique but just one basic take take away and um, i would in fact start with the reverse order uh, rajiv i would uh, go to you first Are you there, Raji? Is he there? Uh, Raji, sir, can you unmute yourself? Raji, come on, sir. Raji is here. Yes, Raji, come on. Yes, he's there. My side would be that uh, Raji, we can't hear you. Can you just type it? can you just type it and then i can read it aloud for the benefit of audience and meanwhile what i'm going to do is that i'm just going to uh, maybe move on to mujib yes mujib over to you see the only point that i was trying to make with this presentation is that we are overplaying the role of connectivity and universal values and the way in which we can harmonize interests you have to understand at one point when we are trying to do non western iit we are doing it as a political undertaking the critique to positivism has already been made so many times and it has been shown to be complicit with the project of american empire so the question of methodology or epistemology is not as simply that you can have a neutral point of view and you can you know harmonize everybody's interests the ontological position that is the original essence of being non western and we're not just one big non western family we are different people and we relate with each other very differently next time you want to do non western iit you want to think on how to do non western iit you interrogate these very premises of nation state and the way in which you are arguing about strategies or for example many presenters presented that they are indigenous strategies you have to answer the question that what is the core of your thought which gives substance to this strategy everybody has strategies muslims have the mirror of princes the huge literature on how to do straight care but that is not the core or the essence of a non western thought the essence of for example the arthashastra would be dharma you have to define the dharma you have to explain what dharma is similarly in islamic thought you have to explain what tauhid is and similarly in different thoughts you have to understand this settlement which in modern politics has taken place between religion and secularism which is where our ontology gets you know 
entangled and which is where we have to unentangle it and project it in through our work in non-Western world. Thank you. Excellent, absolutely excellent. Uh, Sudesh, over to you. Sudesh, are you there? Yeah. Hello, ma'am. Yes, over to you, Sudesh. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, ma'am. And uh, I, I think that uh, Mujib just made an excellent point here, and I, I also agree with him. But uh, at the same time, I think that, you know, we also should think in terms of how we make the non-Western study the core, you know, instead of being the periphery, such as the argument that has been delivered by Chikner and Blady. And how do we decenter the definition of IR? And then we make it more inclusive. Secondly, I think that you know scholar uh, you know scholarly community society of the core are not known as most of them, which again is uh, I mean um, debated by Tickner and Blaney. They operate in the shadow of already dominated IR framework. So definitely this this panel you know the. South Asian panel we have is definitely moving towards uh, working against this kind of a system. And thirdly, what we see as differently different, you know, when we talk about non-Western international relations, most of the scholars that, that are talking about non-Western international relations themselves are Western. So how do we become differently different? And this thing is coming out and I was just thinking that, you know, maybe a critique of itself will be a big way to begin. And then another problem of, you know, Western historians defining other countries through low points, which Chandan Nair has debated in one of his art shows. You know, Western historians and uh, scholars, they always uh, define other countries. And even the terminology of Global South is highly debated here. So I think that, you know, when they are trying to define us from our low points, we should make a counter, a counter argument for that. For an example, when Churchill talked about the uh, Bengal famine, he said that it was due to the quality of the soil. But then, you know, the reality was that he was giving all the rice that was cultivated there to the uh, army at, at that time. You know, so the real aspect of what is what was uh, actually going on is being hidden so i feel that you know these realities should be you know uh, really uh, thought critically by scholars thank you thank you thank you sudesh uh, again uh, you know a thoughtful response there raj over to you uh, thank you ma'am uh, i was just thinking through it what how how could i uh, respond to this thing that uh, non-Western and IR and uh, what's coming immediately in my mind is the fact that there are a lot of complexities and qualities in societies. One through which I was uh, and really to excavate those things which were probably missed out earlier uh, and the lens through which I was entering was non-humans but when I come here the other and the, it's, it's also important because of the place where I'm situated in is also South Asia and on West. So it brings in another perspective, which is of how do South Asia and this non-human mingle together. Uh, I have been for now thinking more on this environmental history angle as in how uh, through environmental history and these three things together can be brought in. But as uh, you pointed out, and as Dave Tanu said, that there's a ri very rich tradition existing uh, in, say, thought or philosophy, which has been talking about it. So maybe there's a takeaway for me as well that how non human and non Western thought can be brought in together. And maybe I'll, I'll, you know, that's like I'll work on it uh, more and uh, we will, 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 will be much more informed in the coming days. Very happy to hear that, Raj. And uh, Seema and Deepraj. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> uh, thank you for opportunity, ma'am. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, our sessions, uh, non-Western thought and uh, international relations is uh, very relevant in uh, contemporary time. Uh, like uh, we, uh, we overwhelmingly emphasize on the reading the traditional IR, uh, such as realism and uh, liberalism. Uh, 
uh, new religions, uh, but um, they mainly consider the uh, state as a, a homogeneous entity and uh, dichotomize the uh, domestic and international politics. Uh, I was reading the, but uh, this both are the problematic to define IR accurately in contemporary time, I think. And uh, I would like to um, cite the Stephen Wall. The, in I, I was going through the on Twitter and I found his uh, tweet. And uh, I want to cite this tweet. And uh, he write, a lot of US foreign policy experts are um, worried about China rights. And me too. And But how many of these experts have reflected on fact that the China has not been uh, fighting war in a lot of places while steadily gaining greater wealth, power, and influences, question mark. And um, ma'am, from this uh, like a tweet, his tweet, uh, I want to interpret two, two things, which is own uh, confusion on US um, uh, IR export uh, regarding the China's mindset, and uh, which also related with, uh, which also like um, give sense of the, how the importance to understand China before formulate the policy towards China. Like, so here comes the importance of the alternative sources of uh, diplomacy and strategic things, and uh, also um, non-Western uh, thought and international relations, ma'am. Um, thank you, ma'am. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Seema? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, like right now, we are talking about non-Western thoughts and the international relation, a very relevant concept like all of us talked about. So most, most of the talks uh, in the international relations are based on Western concepts and then theories. But now, since we are talking about non-Western aspect as well, it's very important. And then now, particularly like our uh, presentation was on the small states and the games and the text. Like we are, we are bringing the small state diplomacy as a really event thing like small states are not just the object but subject of international relation as a small states scholars say and at the same time we are talking about the games of the small states and bringing these things it's very relevant because it should come in public domain and then we will get wisdom about small state diplomatic practices and we will get to learn more and um, in the international relation it will be really important so i find it interesting these talks which are coming forward in these days thank you Thank you. Thank you, Seema. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, Chaminda? Thank you, Madam, giving uh, this opportunity again. Uh, what I want to share, uh, uh, we have to rethink of the criticism that IR is dominated by Western philosophies and Western ideas, because when we closely examine the existing literature, existing theories, specifically literature on regionalism, what we can say now that we cannot actually accept that uh, IR is or the IR theorization, lack of non-Western ideas. So non-Western ideas and experiences, they are incorporated in uh, uh, IR theorization. But what we uh, cannot see is the uh, emphasis given to these uh, aspects. So I believe that there should be adequate emphasis recognitions for these uh, ideas and experiences. I think that only they can become very active players or the elements uh, of IR theorization. And also, finally, I want to say that uh, so we need a sort of rigorous analysis, analytical framework in terms of uh, methodological aspect. So we need to bring uh, how we can connect these non-Western ideas experience uh, with the analytical rigor to the existing uh, theorization. So then I think we would be able to uh, create a fair uh, space for non-Western ideas and experiences uh, in theorization of international relations. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Chaminda. And I think that was really indeed a lovely session because I myself, I personally gained a lot. And um, all of you, I'm so proud of you because you literally 
took me on that brainstorming roller coaster ride and i really wish you all the best you know for the future future projects because i'm sure another 5 10 years down the line uh, you know we'll have significant uh, you know i would say scholars uh, trying to make great contributions uh, to the process of knowledge production per se you know as ir students and i have uh, the response from rajiv here and the response says and i'll read it um, the rise of the non western perspectives would enrich the discourse and multiverse of ir either state centric or world centric the essence of the fifth debate triggers and accelerates further the rigor of scientism rationalism and emotionalism it is about mutual recognition and equality in international relations so i think that's well said rajiv and i think uh, you know this shift from a universe to a pluriverse i think people have been talking about plural epistemologies people have been talking about an epistemological violence you know uh, when one gets into these two traditions say the positivist and the interpretivist tradition but i think there is equally yes as you rightly put out an ontological violence and there is a multiverse out there a pluriverse out there which needs to be engaged with and i think non western thought has significant contribution when it really comes to these very significant ontological questions the questions of being as one of the panelists in uh, uh, this uh, session uh, said so on to that note i would literally thank try to really thank all the panelists here wonderful job done by all of you i think to my mind this was really an excellent panel and uh, i do hope that nice can really take the spirit forward and give platform to these young minds these young students to come and speak their minds out and i think that itself is the very first step towards becoming a seeker of knowledge and on that note um, like to thank each one of you and over to uh, my colleagues from anice who are present here to take the session further thank It's you over. so much ma'am thank, thank you thank you everyone distinguished chair speakers ladies and gentlemen As we have come to the end of this session we would like to express a sincere gratitude and thanks to the chair for agreeing to chair and moderate the session today. A sincere thanks also goes to all the speakers for being a part of the event and delivering such comprehensive and convincing presentations. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends from the diplomatic community, experts, academia, media and different organizations. Finally we must also mention our deep sense of appreciation for the audience who participated in the webinar and those who are watching us live thank you for your valuable time and attention and for making this session productive with your questions once again we are truly honored to have you all with us today please do join us in the next session thank you so much